As the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, progresses, the Department of Health and Human Services is taking away the religious freedom that all Americans are guaranteed by the First Amendment by requiring that all employers, regardless of religious conscience, provide all forms of contraception to their employees and even to minors without the knowledge of their parents. In response to this assault on the Constitution, Catholic leaders are stepping up and are searching for what can be done within the bounds of the law to deliver quality health care that follows the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. The Make Straight the Pathway Conference was held in Houston, Texas in March of 2013 on the campus of the University of St. Thomas to shed light on the critical problem of providing quality health care and protecting everyone's religious freedoms. So I'm going to open it up for questions either of me or from the other members of the panel um, and to, um, to talk about um, uh, your questions or ways or suggestions that you might have um, that we'll be able to reach out and work better together to achieve the common goals that we have. So I open it up to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm a little confused about um, when you were talking about this TXCatholic.org, uh, the two are the two uh, angels that are in the parishes. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't quite sure how you're utilizing them. They went, so in, in, the, in, the, in our parishes, being able to post the information to make sure that it shows work with the pastor and the office to make sure that um, the action alerts get posted through the group, uh, through the par parishioners in the narthexes of the churches to, um, if we're asking for a petition drive, they'll be the point person to make that petition drive happen. They'll become the point person to answer questions. So we have a lot of churches, particularly here in, in Galveston, Houston, and in, um, in San Antonio, that have started these little um, interior uh, work groups um, that they reach out to their own representatives and congressmen. And so there's a core group of like 18 people, 18, 20 people that debate these issues, talk about them, share the information, and then organize uh, their parish to participate. You know, the reason I'm asking is because um, I have a vision, and my vision is to create uh, centers of life that are an alternative to Planned Parenthood so that Planned Parenthood disappears into the sunset. And um, my vision is that we already have the infrastructure, which is the parishes, but what we don't have is there is no education in those parishes about all these issues. They, get, they get, might get a beautiful homily, et cetera, et cetera, but there is no, they're totally uneducated. That's why the vote went to Obama. I, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely right. The second part, I think, is, is that I don't think people know how to organize anymore. Well, I have a plan okay. to go well, into the parish systems with programs that are very easily um, put into them with a couple of point guard women to bring the education to these issues. And um, so anyway, just because you, I mean, you're, you're confirming everything, we can do this. Yeah. We this have got to motivate these parishes and wake them up. I can tell time. you from New York, I can get that. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was gonna say there's a workshop about all that on Saturday. There's a part of this conference, yeah. so. On, uh, on April 9th, for those of you who are, are from Texas, and even if you're not, if you want to fly down here from, or for April 9th, we'd be happy to have. We're having an advocacy day at the, the Texas Capitol where we're bringing, um, right now the count is at about 3,000 folks from across the state of Texas from all of our parishes that are going to descend on the Texas Capitol um, and meet with their legislators. And we usually, Cardinal Donardo is going to do the, the invocation in the Senate. Archbishop Gustavo is going to do it in the House. All of our bishops will be there. We're going to have a rally on the South Steps. The best part of this, though, is we give them all T-shirts. They have these nice blue T-shirts. And if you've ever been in the Texas House, all the activity, the, the actual activity takes place on the floor, but the galleries circle uh, uh, up above. So all the, you know, the gallery looks down on the... And so when you have all these Catholics in the blue shirts looking down, it's like the Coliseum, and it's like, nah. and so um, they get introduced from the floor, and these legislators look up, and they see the, the sea of blue um, staring at them and, and uh, disapproving. Yes, sister. 
I want to follow up on two things. One thing very important you said is it's not just about saying no to the Affordable Care Act. Currently, I'm working in home health, and I see how many people are not getting decent health care. And I think we have to say yes to what are we proposing, because otherwise, outside, we just look like, yes, I would have got just always saying no to something. <laughs> Secondly, the ecumenical dimension, um, Steve Ray at Religious Freedom Rally in Oklahoma City, which is one of the largest ones in, in the country uh, last June, uh, there were very many Baptist ministers, Church of Christ, and he said, I want to thank President Obama for doing something that we haven't been able to do in Oklahoma on our own, and that is come together as people of faith. And so I think we have to look also at how it's motivating us to not just be lukewarm and to put God-given values in, in Jesus back at the center of our lives and what we say and what we do. So I think we need to, Father Anthony set up last night for those who are at the Mass, um, it's nice to reason through all this, but then we have to be living witnesses of it. And I've lived out of the country for 15 years in France, which as you know, um, is not stellar in many ways, at, even as the eldest daughter of the church. And I'd like to suggest we learn from a lesson of my own experience there, and that is um, Senator Jean Leonetti, from, who's from Nice, kind of empty down on the southern coast, there was a whole push for assisted suicide and euthanasia to be legalized in France, and we know how it's gone in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and so it's just contagious. I mean, all of France could fit into Texas. I mean, that's how, how small France is and how big Texas is. And yet, what they were able to do, um, and it's very bipartisan, and there was a whole push in the media and in the personal opinion, um, culture was not embracing Christian values. And what they were able to do was to get the reporters outside the President Sarkozy at the time, named a commission to look at the end of life questions, and they brought in experts. And I, what I want to say is I learned from that is they came up with a law that was, the law is perfect, but it was so much better than anything else was out there. But what they did is they like, whether it would be the equivalent of the Democrat or Republican side, each one is a human being, shared their experience, of death and dying, and those that were for assisted suicide in euthanasia have had some horrible experience of somebody suffering terribly at the end of life. And those that were for palliative care and hospice care had had some beautiful experience of compassionate accompaniment at the end of life. And so what Jean Leonetti realized is this transcends political dimensions and it touches something of who we are as human beings and what our experience is. And I guess if I could make a suggestion coming back to America after they live out of the country, I see such a polemic that it's just hateful within the church. Progressive and liberal Catholics are throwing stones, I mean, throwing stones to conservatives and throwing those back. And it, I think we need to come to where we go beyond, I'm all for politics, but we need to go beyond that and get back to what makes us most fundamentally human, and that touches into our God given rights and duties and responsibilities. And that law passed, you know what the, the socialist people told him? He said, because they had kept the press out. They had talked, they had received experts, like everybody expressed themselves. So they came up with a law we had to do. And, they, and it was to neither do too much or too little, but to respect. And he said that the socialist people said to him, we've got to sign this before we get out. And he passed it unanimously, the law. He said, we've got to sign it before we get outside because we know this is right, but it was not at all on the political agenda. And so everybody was willing, in the name of the human conscience that had been awakened in the sharing of personal experience and respect for life, came out winning in a climate that was not at all for that. It's been attacked since then, but they were able to pass the most value-based law that happened in the 15 years I lived there because they went beyond the political cleavage and stone throwing. And we need to do that in our churches and in our communities because we, we see now coming in the world. Well, I, I think that's absolutely So put, let's put Christ first and the human person first. And if we can live, the, I've heard horrible things come out of the mouths of very well-meaning and intentioned parties on both sides. And I think we're doing, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I think we're doing ourselves harm if we don't live the truth of the mother, respect the other. What can I learn? Why do they believe what they believe? 
maybe because their grandmother had nothing to eat, or maybe because their mother suffered being, you know, had an abortion, it wasn't given any help, it was condemned and excommunicated, whatever. Right. So I just want to put that. Well, I appreciate that. I think that's, uh, I think that's extremely important. Look across the divide. Gentlemen, did he, anyone, Jonathan? Oh, you want to know what I think? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I think there's a lot of value to that. I mean, there's always going to be outside pressure um, for elected officials um, to decide whether or not this is right. But, you know, they have constituents that they have to answer to. So um, there's a reason why you do have folks um, that want to be a part of the process. And while, while I can see the value of... Um, you know, keeping people in certain quarters and, you know, maybe they, they felt like as soon as they got out of that room, they'd be questioned. Um, we do have to be careful. Uh, there are reasons why issues polarize folks, whether it's politically or for faith-based reasons. Um, and so we often know that someone says, well, this legislation is really for this, and it turns out they want to do something else with it. So, and I'm not, you know, I like to consider myself an optimist but I've seen a lot of things in my short time involved in some of these things that there, there is reason why there's a lot of scrutiny, a lot of media pressure, a lot of pressure from folks on our side, why there's a lot of attention, and it's good to have transparency as much as possible when it comes to elected officials doing things. And I will tell you all, one of the phrases you hear at the Capitol a lot is, uh, the best bill is no bill. Sometimes it's better to do nothing at a certain point instead of passing something that is not what you really need and doesn't have the effect that you want and then end up doing doing harm later on and then you have to redo it you have to try to rewrite it and try to undo that process is very difficult and so uh, but I do think the ability for folks to come together whether it's denominational whether it's people uh, you know that are Jewish whoever they support our values folks that are you know Muslim if you know we're, we're together on certain issues uh, that are that are principled um, I think we do need to seek to do that when there's an opportunity um, as long as we feel like there's a trust issue that that someone's not trying to to undermine us from uh, from inside and so but you know um, a lot of times that's why you see things don't get done is because folks just there's just not the trust there and so sometimes that takes time but sometimes you know what so be it if that's um, we, we try another day um, and uh, we wait until we get it right. Well, and the other thing I, that I, I really want to underscore from Jonathan's presentation is the idea of where the playing field is actually taking place. I mean, the, the point he makes is, you know, we're all from Austin and we're, we're able to cover the Capitol. But a lot of the issues that we're talking about in terms of religious liberty are taking place in our cities, in our school boards, in our county governments, um, within our diocese. And, you know, if we don't field a team that is able to address those issues at a local level, there's not much help that we're going to be able to do on a statewide level, or we're, or we're going to miss it. And I think that puts us at a disadvantage as well. The, the, the cities and school boards that Jonathan's talking about, about same-sex marriage um, and undermining the, the idea of uh, marriage being between a man and a woman is not something that we necessarily, you know, although there have been bills that have been introduced on the state level, uh, one by a Catholic, surprisingly enough, it's... Uh, but we, we feel fairly confident that those won't go anywhere, but it's in the cities in which those things take place that we need to be able to, to build that infrastructure and that strength um, to, to really have those, vo those voices be heard. Jeff, can I just pick up on that? Because we're seeing on the litigation side, <coughs> they can't win at the Texas State Legislature. I mean, they can't win on these issues through the legislation. Where they do win are the city of Austin, for instance, that Pregnancy Resource Center. What was that? That was the city ordinance trying to restrict, uh, trying to limit <coughs> what pregnancy resource centers could do. City of Dallas, city of Houston, putting in their, their city ordinances protections for prohibiting uh, discrimination on the basis of, of sexual orientation using their, their language. And so they're attacking people of faith through those ordinances. You're exactly right. It, it, the battleground are at the city's states, Waco, this week, right? We, we, we heard Waco is considering passing. Waco, that's, that's a good Baptist city, isn't it? With Baylor there. Um, Waco City uh, uh, going to do some protections for, for uh, homosexuals. So you're right. I mean, that is, and what we need, you know, as, as lawyers and as, as people in, on the public policy, we need to know, because I, I don't know what's happening in Midland right now. I mean, I can't imagine Midland would do that, but 
they no one shows up at those meetings, right? And then boom, there they got it. And then that, you know, and it may be too late. We need to stay. I mean, we need people standing up. At, well, the, and the perfect example is that the Austin with the Pregnancy Resource Centers is that they, the the sign it's issue, which is we, we the Austin Diocese has had to file a lawsuit on. During the debate in the city council about requiring the signage at the pregnancy resource centers, their own the own city attorney told the city council, "This is unconstitutional. This isn't going to this isn't going to stand. You know, you're 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 just setting us up for litigation." And then and the city council said, "Okay, you know, it, well let's let's see, let's see if the religious people are going to come and fight us on it. And if they do, then we'll do it. But there's a little bit of you know." Cockiness amongst those people, thinking that ah, oh, the, the 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 Catholics or the the Baptists or those groups, they they won't. They'll just let it go, and they've become way too complacent on that because we've allowed them to come to come complacent and not uh, address them. Well, and, I, and if I could just add one more thing to that, Jeff, big picture strategy wise, on all these issues, um, I've come to the realization, Jeff, Jeff, many of us, that no matter what we do every year. The, the battles that we win, the, the victories we have, in a large way, they're temporary. I mean, we've come to, to, to recognize, even if it's at the U.S. Supreme Court, the folks that disagree with us on these issues, it's not as if, well, you know, okay, we lost this, let's go on to something else. They wake up the next day, they're like, okay, how do we fight it again? So, what I, you know, in some of the examples you are hearing about that we're talking about, these lawsuits have been won before. These laws have been passed before. The Constitution has been amended. You know, we're talking about the definition of marriage. Um, a school district should not be able to recognize a different marital arrangement other than one man and one woman. They're doing it anyway with, with what Jeff is saying. Well, then sue us. You know, the city of Austin, sue us. What are you going to do? You know, we'll, we'll take our chances in court. We'll take our chances in venues where we think it's more favorable to us. And so there is no sense to them of, of losing. It's just, you know, when do we fight again on this issue? And so um, their strategy is just continue to do it any other way they can, to come around uh, from different directions. And th I think to them, um, and I just say them as folks that disagree with us on some of these issues, um, they are people, you know, that have, that, uh, that, um, you know, that have their, their rights, so to speak. But their view of it, of winning is fighting of challenging it, of it being involved. There, it's not so much of whether they actually win or lose, it's the fact that they're involved in it, and they will not stop until they have remade, reshaped, and changed all of these principles that, that y'all care about, that we care about. And so, um, and that can be at times frustrating, but I think it's good to recognize that, and to recognize the way that we live out our faith and do what's right is continuing to stay engaged and think of different ways to organize, think of different ways to come together uh, from different backgrounds, because um, the more splitting that takes place, the harder it does get on our side. Yeah, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is a long-term marathon. Yes, sir. I had a couple of questions about the potential constitutional amendment to protect uh, religious freedom. Uh, I think I heard you mention that in another state, a similar amendment lost. That's right. I'd like, to, I'd like to hear you talk about North how Dakota. that happened. And then the, yeah. my second question is, uh, if you want to either run down or say for the Houston area representatives and senators where they stand or who would be good, to, who needs to hear from us? Sure. Uh, on the first part of the question in North Dakota, um, from what I understand through different methods, Planned Parenthood put a lot of money into that ballot initiative. Oh, and, tremendous. Set yeah. people from the state. They invaded the state. So I think that took some people by surprise. I don't think they realized where the money was coming from. And before they could kind of get back around and recognize that they were outspent, it was almost over. What was the argument? What was the message that prevailed? Well, the message was they misled people on what the law would do. They suggested that issues of, of crime would not be enforced. You know, that... Um, you know, if people would use anything and say that it was for religious beliefs that they, you know, sexually abused people and that they, you know, physically abused them. And um, they went, I think they went the domestic violence route. I mean, they used a lot of things that just were not true. Yeah, they talked about, they focused on prisoners a lot of time because it would give prisoners certain rights and it would hurt, rights and it would hurt, it would bankrupt the state because you'd have to give all these things for prisoners. What they do is they just start piecing arguments and depending on who they're speaking to at that time, they kind of focus on that. So they used economic 
economic arguments that would cost the state more money. Well, North, we don't have any more money. I mean, you can imagine how it would play and, out even here. Yeah. And these issues like that, as far as um, things that religious liberty does not apply to, it doesn't give you the ability just to do whatever you want in the name of faith. They have been dealt with by the courts for decades. And so there are endless examples of that's not true, that's not true. You wouldn't be able to use your religion for this. You wouldn't, you know, criminal, there, there's, um, it's called a, uh, the state has an interest in having certain laws that protect people's rights uh, on criminal issues that are not going to be trumped because of someone's religious belief. And so, and that's not what any of us want anyway. And so, um, so they just misled and lied to people and then put a lot of money into it. And I think that some of the folks there were just, um, you know, caught, maybe caught a little bit off guard. And so we've, we've been able, we've worked with some of those groups that have been involved in that. There have been national conferences where people have had discussions and recognized what can we learn from that and how can we have a better strategy moving forward. And so, um, so I'm encouraged by that. Um, but that's a big part of it. But they'll do the same thing again. I mean, they'll continue to try to um, scare people to think that somehow uh, people are going to have too much religious freedom and, you know, that they're going to be doing outlandish things that, that they're not going to be stopped from. And that's not going to happen. It's, it's really easy against. And then the Houston area. The Houston area legislators. Oh, I'm sorry. So legislators in Houston, they're... Um, you know, there are plenty. I could give you a list. Well, I know who they are, but I'm saying, who Most is, of, are, they, are they already with us? Do they need to hear from us? Yeah, um, we did this last session, and there were a number of, of elected officials in the Houston area. There was predominantly Republican. There were some Democrat. I don't know if there were any Democrats from the Houston area, but some in other parts of the state, predominantly in the south part of the state. So, um, but we can we can provide you a list of that and, and give you some heads up. But now's the time to start talking to them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, what have, you, what have you heard about the uh, recent Arkansas state bill on the heartbeat? They what? passed just Wednesday where they really restricted uh, abortions. To, uh, you can hear a heartbeat, you can't do it. But Trump takes it. Yeah, it's 12 weeks. Yes. Um, and I mean, it's going to be attacked. Yeah, even in Arkansas. It hasn't been, was it, well, the been filed. Well, said it's not legal. It's passed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the governor, they ever wrote the, they ever wrote the governor's veto, but that yeah. governor's not the friendliest to, yeah. to life issues. He's, um, I mean, it's going to it's going to end up at the courts, cool. uh, and you know, it, and, it's a type of issue that could work its way up through Arkansas Eighth <coughs> Circuit, I believe, yeah. Eighth Circuit, and then up, up up to the Supreme Court. But at least uh, it's encouraging. We got legislators yeah. really trying. To that's right. Well, and. And, you know, as y'all would expect, when we're helping legislators draft this legislation, we're already anticipating it's going to be challenged. I mean, you know, we realize if it actually is going to do something good, the other side's going to file a lawsuit. I mean, they don't care. I mean, it is not a matter of cost to them or whatever. This is how they operate. And our side um, does this as well sometimes if we think something's going to pass that shouldn't. But so when we're working with legislators, uh, we're bringing as many lawyers on board. That's why you saw some of those professors on that letter, as many minds to get it right, because you know for sure they're going to challenge it um, and it's going to be scrutinized. And so um, so you're already game planning for that. Um, you know, the same thing happened with the sonogram bill here in the state of Texas. We helped with the drafting. Jeff, a lot of great people helped on making sure the language was right. It was challenged. It was upheld by the Fifth Circuit. Uh, thank goodness. But, um, but you know, there was a lot of work and so on um, during the litigation phase as well. And so you know that going in. Um, but, you know, even if it – here's the other thing. Say it gets struck down. Okay. Go back the next session and pass it. I mean, that's what the other side does. We have to have the mindset of then let's do it again. You know, when our opportunity comes, let's do the same thing. And so um, that's the attitude, I think, if we continue to adopt so we're not surprised and think, oh, let's move on to something else. Um, but just being engaged at that level and having an impact and doing something, that's where the victory is, um, if nothing less. And so I, I want you all to know whether you win or lose, the fact that you are trying has so much value, not only here, but eternally. So yeah, we popped the champagne corks last session, the night that would impact the and then two days later, we were starting to work to defend we're, uh, and defending. And, and we've done that this entire session. Now it's a, we made tremendous strides in the last session in pro-life issues. And so this time, it's now playing uh, a defensive game to keep them up. We, let's have one more question because I think we need to, to get to, to the lunch. Yes. Um, when you were speaking earlier about the bishops getting their message out more publicly and in the parishes, one issue that came up in my mind, and I think is worth commenting on is, I guess, nonprofit status and what the priest preaches on the pulpit and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Because I think clarifying that is a good thing because they're afraid that, well, if I talk anything politics, we're going to, you know. 
Uh, every year, the bishops send a, um, the regulations and guidelines for uh, parishes and political activity, and it, it clearly delineates what can and cannot be done in the parishes for um, policy making and political activity. No voters guides, you can't bring candidates in, you can't hand out push cards, but the issues, what the, the topics that are important to us, those are absolutely fair game, and there's nothing uh, within our 501c3 status that has anything to stop us from doing that. Now, you are going to, I will tell you, I, I go across all the, I travel the whole state. I mean, uh, you know, France is, not, I must have traveled France 80 times by this time going across Texas. Um, but, and I will get people that will have different opinions. And that's what we ask as a church, is we ask for people to form their own conscience with the guidance of their the magisterium of their bishops and their priests and prayer um, and, and to really form these. And people will have differences. But, you know, at a certain point, we have to celebrate the differences and have that dialogue, but also come together at the end that we all have the exact same principles that are guiding us as we go forward. And I think people, in a lot of senses, the, the politics and policymaking, a lot of because of television, has gotten very, very um, nasty. And there are people that sit on their computers and put stuff on Facebook that you would never dare say to someone to their face. But they still think that it's they're Bill O'Reilly and they're going to say whatever they want. And, um, and I think that kind of dampers that. We just need to be able to be supportive and thoughtful and, and engage in that debate and not be afraid of doing it. Well, let, let me just add on, on that issue. It is the, the IRS's rule which prohibits, for instance, a, a priest... Uh, a, a pastor, religious leader, from endorsing a candidate is unconstitutional. Right. The IRS will not challenge. I mean, they won't go to court with us on it. So all, instead, they're out there telling people what they can't do. Uh, and but when it push comes to shove, and actually there, uh, the other side filed a lawsuit against the IRS, claiming, "Why aren't you enforcing this rule? It's an IRS rule." So we're looking for priests and pastors who are willing to stand up and challenge. Not in, not in, not in Texas. You're not. Um. With all respect, Tim, help me. Do, do some. And if David Barton were here, he would tell you about how active, and we all know this, or we should know this, how active religious leaders were in the founding of our nation. If that rule were in effect then who knows what would have happened. That, that's absolutely true. And, and, and so, you know, it's an IRS rule. It's not a constitutional rule. Right. The IRS is using it uh, to, to squelch political activity. It, it violates the First Amendment. I applaud those, the, 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 those men who are willing to, to speak up. And, and quite frankly, this last election, lots did. Can you go uh, talk to the TCC for <laughs> Well, I, I would suggest too that ninety-nine the USCCB. Ninety-nine percent of the time, though, that that's not what's happening. And it is civil disobedience. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I, I'm there. It, it's civil disobedience. But ninety-nine percent of the time, the uh, the uh, clergy, faith leaders, they're not even close to the line, though. They're getting threatening letters and they're being harassed just for what Jeff was talking about, doing what's permissible. Um, you know, and that's, this is not, they're not constitutional lawyers, not that, you know, I, I'm aware of any clergy that are, some of them may, but that's not what they do. So, I mean, you know, um, so I can see how it does have the impact of silencing them at times, which is unfortunate. So I'm glad that, you know, Jeff and others are doing things to continue to inform them of what they are able to do. I mean, if they just did that much of, of what we know, without a doubt, is permissible and is not as attacked as much, uh, I think we'd be in much better shape. Richard, can you have the last word, please? Well, uh, at the USCCB, we rather like the distinction between taking positions on issues and taking positions on people. And our own internal policy is stricter than that of the IRS because we don't generally even take positions on uh, nominees for public office for the courts or for cabinet posts or anything else. Uh, there's a long... Uh, long tradition of Catholic teaching saying the job of the bishops and the institutional church is to teach the principles and inform consciences, not that we do a better, good enough job of that either, but there's a lot more to do there, and it is the task of the laity to go out and get this into the political world. I'm kind of happy with that distinction. Uh, and if, they, if a priest did endorse a candidate, they wouldn't go after him, they'd go after the entire budget of his bishop. And uh, we've had a suit on that. We uh, lasted about 10 years. And uh, we had to go to the Supreme Court three times on it. 
the abortion rights mobilization case. And it, the problem is, we won, but even the fact that that suit existed and that we spent so long being threatened with $100,000 a day fines is one of the things that has unfortunately made many priests skittish about doing exactly what they can and should do, which is to talk about the urgent issues that are arising in public policy. So I may have to disagree yeah, with no, my no, we're not, that, we're not uh, that far apart. We're not that far apart. I mean, my the, the key piece is mine is if you can't if you regulate what they say, then the next step is you're not going to be allowed to talk and give a homily on abortion. You're not going to be you're not going to be allowed to talk about the, the sanctity of marriage because that's how that's what's happening in other countries yeah. and that's what they're doing and that's where they're headed. So let's fight now. But let's give our panel a hand. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeff Gardner. And on behalf of the John Paul II Life Center and the Christus Medicus Foundation, thank you for watching this presentation. The need for more crisis pregnancy centers and Christ-centered medical practices throughout the United States is critical and ongoing, and we'd like to encourage you to get involved. Before you do, there are a couple of important takeaways that we'd like to leave you with. First and foremost, develop a strong and clear vision of what it is you want to create be sure that you understand the distinctions between a crisis pregnancy center, a family practice clinic, an OBGYN clinic, a multidisciplinary medical practice, or a sonogram center. Familiarize yourself, too, with the not-for-profit laws as they pertain to health care in your state. John Paul II Life Center operates within the state of Texas. Your laws may vary. Also, before you begin either to explore a crisis pregnancy center or a Christ-centered medical practice, get the blessing of your bishop. Get a committed and unified board. If you can, get the cooperation of your local Catholic hospital. Organize and identify physicians who can be key in helping you getting your project off the ground. Develop a strategic plan and within it include the right professionals, those that you'll need to advise you in all aspects of your endeavor. Familiarize yourself with the fundamentals of fundraising, communication, and education. Everyone involved does not need to know how to do everything, but everyone involved should know about everything that needs to be done. To open a Christ-centered medical practice, understand the financial operations of a clinic. When considering the financial arrangements needed to establish a clinic, it has been our experience that the first year costs, including salaries, is a minimum of $500,000 and can be supported by a recruitment agreement for a physician with a cooperating hospital. Also, care should be taken to consult with an appropriate practice management company to assist you in setting up the medical clinic and to get the correct assistance with licensing, credentialing for hospital privileges, and third-party contracts, as well as billing and collections with the best electronic medical records and healthcare information technology available. Right now, a national platform is under development to include a service company that will help take advantage of economies of scale so medical clinics and pro-life centers across the United States can be created. For more information, please contact us at Kimberly at jpiilifecenter.org. That's Kimberly at jpiilifecenter.org.